On Wednesday nights, we're in a study on predestination, and it seems that we never run out of information on this subject. Let me, the verse that we're using as a key verse and as our text for this is Romans 8 and 29. Let me just give you Romans 8, 28 and 29. Let's go back over to Romans 8 and 28 and 29. Verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good. That is the word agathos, A-G-A-T-H-O-S. A-G-A-T-H-O-S. And that word means beneficial. Beneficial. Or what is beneficial to us? That's everything. It doesn't matter if it, we think it's bad, if it's cancer, if it's losing our job or gaining a job or... Uh, having a car wreck, every step of our lives are arranged by God, and it's good for us. In fact, that's what it says. That's why First Thessalonians 5.18, the Scripture says, In everything give thanks. When I think of this verse, I always think of that verse. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Everything, not part things, all things. And he says, We know that all things... All these things that we're going to be thankful for that work together for good. Work together for good to them that love God. And that, of course, the word love there is agape. And agape means to walk in the commandments of a king. In a kingdom or of a father in a household. And God's kingdom was Israel. And that was his family because that was Jacob's name. Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel, which means to prevail with God. To them, that who, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. Now, the word conformed has been a key word in this whole study. This word conformed is probably one of the most important words that there is in all of the doctrines of predestination. To be conformed, that's what we're predestined to. Let me write the word predestinate down. Prohorizo is the word predestinate. It means to, it comes from pro meaning before, and the word horizo, that is our word, H O R I Z O N, horizon, and the horizo was, meant the boundary. The boundary, of course, it has the same meaning. It means to pre bound inside the light or to pre horizon. In fact, the word horizo has an H sound. That's a diacritical mark. D-I-A-C-R-I-T. Diacritic. T-I-C-A-L. Diacritical mark is what that is, and that has an H sound, so it is actually H-O-R-I-Z-O. And when you add the N, uh, as they did in the Latin, it, it is the word horizon. So we have been pre-lighted, or predetermined to be inside the light, which is the truth. Now, this has to do with being sons of God. What we're talking about tonight is we're going to talk about adopted or adoption and inheritance. We're we're adopted, we have an inheritance and we're going to be we're going to be caused to conform. Now to conform after we're birthed would have to do, just like a family, conform means to say inside the border of God. When you are a son in a family, let me write predestinated. Oops. Predestinated to adoption and inheritance. Now, when you are birthed in a family or when you're adopted into a family, you are are a son and you have to grow up, grow up and be mature. And of course, the word mature, that comes from M-A-R-T-Y-R or M-A-R-T-U-S, which is the word witness. And a witness was a martyr, one who spoke the truth and died for it. Now, you have to be completed And in order to mature, you have to eat the right food. You have to eat food. You have to exercise. And the Bible says that godliness, that bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness 
is profitable. That is our spiritual exercise, is godliness. And of course, the word godliness is E-U-S-E-B-E-I-A. And that means a well comes from E-U and a well S-E-B-O-M-A-I, Sebomai. And the word Sebomai means the gospel scheme. And there is a word that, that is the word schema I'll talk about. I don't know if I'll have time tonight. It is the word schema, and God has a schema, and it's the word that means to fashion. S-C-H-E-M-A. S-C-H-E-M-A. And there's a scheme that God has, and the gospel is the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and the resurrection, that's the word A-N-A-S-T-A-S-I-S, and of course, anastasis means to rise from the dead, from the dead, and in order to be dead, you have to die. This means to arise after dying, and we die daily according to the 15th chapter. We take our cross and die daily, and if you're a son in a family, and you're adopted or you have an inheritance, you have to abide by the rules of the, of the household. And of course, the scripture says God's Israel, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything, but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And of course, that word rule is K-A-N-O-N, that word, we get our word C-A-N-O-N, and the word canon, the canon of Scripture, is the Word of God. This is what we call the canon. And of course, canon comes from C-A-N, or K-A-N-E, cane, and a cane pole was what they used to measure, to build a house, and we are the house of God, and they would take and treat the cane pole and solutions and make it straight and make it level, and we have to be leveled. Remember, that is the word, T-I-T-H-E-M-I. -E and the word straight, when the baptism of repentance is, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. It is E-U-T-H-U-S-S. -S, and it comes from you and, and titheme, T-I-T-H-E-M-I. -E and that means a well leveling, to level in a passive or a horizontal posture, and what measures us is the cane or the cannon or God's rule. This is, what, this is what levels us, and when you have a level foundation, you can build an upright house, and the Bible says we are God's house, so whenever we're the house of God, the house has to be built and completed. When you start off as a son, and you're going to grow up and be mature, one day, you're going to be a full-grown man. One day, you're going to be a full-grown house with a roof on it. And what's that word? Y'all remember that word? Oikodomeo. O-I-K-O-D-O-M-E-O. -O -O. That is the word edify. Edify. And the scripture says that charity edifieth. And charity is the word agape. It's the same word as love, when we're not talking about there's two words been translated to the Greek language for love. One is the word phileo, which means affection, and the other is the word agape, and that means walking in the commandments of the Father in the household that you were adopted in, and you're going to be leveled by the cane. And they would take actually a cane pole, and it was a leveling factor in the household because a child would receive the rod. It was made out of a straight cane pole, and he would get a beating. That's what levels us is the word of God and the word okodomeo. That's the word, that's the word edify, or it's the same word that's used when Jesus said, I will build. It's the word build, build my church. It means to finish. You have to have a level foundation. You use the cane pole of God, and you build an upright, and that is, you build an upright edifice, and that's the word substance. Faith is the substance. All this is about a family. The word substance is hypostasis, and hypostasis means a constant, continual, or it, hypo means to stay in, 
or continue in the stasis. Of course, we get the word we get the word upright, which is his to make from stasis. So if you're going to build an upright house and put the dome on it, or the domeo, dome is the Greek word for roof, you're going to build an upright house, you have to have a level foundation to build upright. This is about, when you think of yourself as being the house of God, you're a son of God. And if we're sons, then evidently we are we have an inheritance. Let's turn over to Ephesians, the first chapter. Whom he did foreknow, we also did predestinate to be conformed. And how are we conformed? To the image of his son. God's got a mature son. His name is Jesus Christ. He's full grown. He knows exactly how to act. We don't know how to act. And he has predestined us to be conformed. And that word conformed, let me just write it down again. To be conformed is the word sum, M-O-R-P-H-O-S. I did a tape recently uh, called Predestined to Sum. If you don't have that tape on Predestined to Sum, James Fulton called me today, Debbie, I got to tell you this, and he said, I got that tape, Predestined to Sum, and I have listened to it at least 30 times and wore it out. He said, I need another one. <laughs> now, that is one of the strongest tapes I've done because the word morphos comes from the word morphe, and morphe means to be shaped. And when we are shaped, when you're, when you're a little boy, I was a skinny little old kid, and I ain't a very big, much bigger than that now, but I thought I would never grow up. I was always the littlest guy in the class up to a certain point. Me and one other guy would be the two little bitty guys in the class, and I... I shot up from about four foot nine to five foot eight from the eleventh to the twelfth grade. Man, I got real tall at five eight, and I thought I would never grow up. And but see, my arms weren't developed and my legs weren't developed, and I was not developed. I was real small, and I and and that's called a development. And and some of you have maybe Ken remembers a time in his life where he went from five. Six to six, two or six, three, all of a sudden, boom, I've seen guys do that. You know what that is? That is being shaped like his father or his mother who's tall. It takes that. That's being shaped. It takes lots of food, and lots of exercise, and lots of time to be mature and to conform the way the father wants us to. And the only way it happens, and I brought this out in that tape, on predestined to sum. Sum is a common word meaning fellowship. It's a prefix they use rather than putting the common word in the Greek, rather than putting the common word K-O-N-I-K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. That's the common word for partake or fellowship. But instead of putting that on the front of a word, they created this little prefix sum, which has the same meaning and in order to be shaped and be like Christ, we must have fellowship with others who are suffering. God never changes. There's one fellowship. It is the fellowship of his suffering. And when we do that, I'm sitting here talking to Andy, or I'm, I'm talking to others, or to Larry, or to Dwight, or Chris, and I'm having fellowship suffering with people who are suffering for Christ. That's the only way we'll grow up and be shaped. I wish everybody would get that tape on predestined to assume because that really is a hard tape and that'll convict all of our hearts. Now let's go over here to Ephesians. I want us to look. We are sons. We are adopted as sons. And I must read here. I'm going to read the first 11 verses of this. And I uh, heard a fellow tell a story about the first 11 verses of this, or this first chapter. He said he asked a guy to read this chapter, and he said, or he said he read this chapter, read the first chapter of Ephesians. He said, do you believe that? He said, not the way you read it. Now, I don't know what that means. Now, let's look here. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ 
by the will of God. Paul was an apostle by the will of God, not by any, anybody else's will. Not by his own will. Not by his own will. <laughs> God struck him down on the road to Damascus, and he didn't give him an invitation to him and say, uh, one of you soldiers saying, just as I... Oh, come on, Paul, and try to beg him to come to the light. He struck him down and said, you're mine, and you're going to do what I tell you. He said, yes, sir. Now, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And there's a comma there, and the thought continues. We're not just chosen. Of course, the word chosen is the word eklegomai. Let me erase some of this. Eklegomai. E-K-L-E-G-O-M-A-I. Let me erase this here. Eklegomai. I'm going to have to erase some. E-K-L-E-G-O-M-A-I. E it comes from ek, that means out, or from the beginning. Out, we get our word exit. And the beginning of a building is at the exit, isn't it? Right? And ek comes, we get our word ex from that. Exit. From the beginning, he has legoed us. That is the movement of the logos. Now, the logos, or the word of God, logos means word, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he's, he has a living Word, and he has a written Word. Now, this is the written Word of God, and Christ is the living Word. And then we've got the printed Word, which is the Bible. And this is God's truth. Let's read here. He says, He's chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. He has chosen to something. That which we should be holy, holy, and without blame. I said here recently that the word blame comes from the word B-L-A-S, P-H-E-M-O-S, blasphemos, and that word blasphemos is a word that comes from the word B-L-A-P-T-O, blapto, sounds like something out of a cartoon, doesn't it? <laughs> blapto. And the word P H E M E, feme, and that word feme is our word fame, or a man's character, or name, which means authority, name, and that comes from the word P H E M I, and the word feme means to say. Now, that means that word blapto means to hinder or speak against the authority or the character that we will have. No one will have any reason to blame us. And this word holy is the word H-A-G-I-O-S. Now, if we actually mature and grow up, hagios means be pure or one in substance. And how you make something one or pure, you purify it. How do you make a son pure? How do you make your sons pure, Rodney? You be this is it right here. That's how you do it. They brought it to church. Good for them. If you will, if God will take the rod and whip us, if you don't the scripture says, if you don't beat your child with a rod, you hate him. That's what the Bible says. And if you beat him with a rod, it shall not kill him. Hadn't killed him yet, has he? And this is for the big ones. Yes. Thank you so much for breaking those because that's how God matures us. He said, I scourge every son that's mine. And sometimes he uses evil men to scourge us with. And sometimes the evil men and women are those in our own household. And sometimes they're believers. 
I've said to some here, I've said, maybe your daughter or your son is a is an enemy to you. I've said, maybe your wife or your husband is your enemy. Maybe God's just raising them up to give you a hard time to purify you. Because God has raised up people in my family to purify me, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're lost people. David said, deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword and thy hand. So if we're going to grow up as sons, we have to be complete. And complete means finished. Remember that word? We talked about it last week. T-E-L-O-S. T-E-L-I-O-S. Teleotes. It means to be completed or finished. It's the same word that was used when the Lord would say, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That doesn't mean be without sin. That means grow up, be completed, be mature, and do the things you're supposed to do for God. Now, let's read on here. This word eklegomai means, this word lego means a systematic discourse. You know what a system is? That computer back there is a system. And it is a discourse. A system means something that has, that systematic, that has some kind of orderly arrangement to it. Well, that's what God has laid down for us. He's laid out an exact word over there in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, the word world is K-O-S-M-O-S. And I understand that you have a stem of the word. The stem is the part that's unchangeable. And when they want to change, when they want to change the, uh, something on the end of the word, the gender, it's actually O-N. They change the ending of the word to make it masculine gender. Or it's actually K O. S M O N. Now that's in the Greek. Cosmon. It's masculine gender. It means an orderly arrangement. That's the word world in John 3 16, whether people like it or not. And it means the orderly arrangement of mankind. God's got an orderly arrangement, so his sons will come to him, grow up, and mature. He births who he wills. Of his own will begat he us. James 1 18. And our new birth in John 1, 13, the scripture says that we were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It was God's will. Nobody willed himself into the kingdom. Because the Bible says there's none good. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. Every man at his best state is altogether vanity. The condition of man, he drinks a nickname like water, Job said in Job 15. Nobody can wake himself to call upon God. Isaiah 64 and 7 says, you can't do it. So God births who he wills. And we were born, not of blood, we didn't inherit it. Nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God's will. That's all. So when we're born, it's by the will of God when we're born spiritually. Let's read on here. He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in agape as we walk in his commandments. What our choosing is about is our walk. He's chosen us that we'll be without blame, that we will be blameless in agape. I've been teaching on blame on Sunday morning. Those who are to take the blame are those who are unrepentant. He's going to see to it that we walk as we mature and grow up and we become grown-up sons. That's, this is what it is. Grown-up sons and you're not born grown-up. You're not born mature where you're able to martyr yourself and do exactly what's right. It takes a paddle and a spanking. Now, let's read on. Having predestinated us Unto the adoption of children. Now, the Gentiles are not any more adopted than believing Jews in the Old Testament. Because Abraham was a Hebrew. The word Hebrew just means a nomadic wanderer. And God, by his free grace and free choice 
chose Abraham out of the sons or the lineage of Shem. He could have chose any number of 100,000 men during that day and time that came out of Shem's lineage, but he, by his own free choice, he chose Abraham and said, you are my man. Now, let me give you this word. Let me give you this word, adoption. We've been adopted. This is what predestination is about. It's about our being adopted. Now, when we're adopted, we're not just adopted. We're adopted unto something. Now, when they said son, when they said son, they didn't mean exactly what may we mean when we say son. They meant something much different. We say that's my son, but Jesus said, who are my brothers and my sisters? My mother, those who do the will of the Father. Who are my sons and my daughters? To a Jew, you were only a son if you were willing to bow to the will of the Father, but you don't have any ability to do that, so he births you, and he has to cause you to be willing with a rod or with a switch or a sword, and it's an evil man. Now, let me give you the word adoption. We've been talking about this. Adoption is the word U-I-O-T-H-E-S-I-A. It has, actually has an H in front of it, but it's, uh, it, it has an H sound. It's huothesia. A huothesia. And it means the placing, the placing as a son, and it comes from two words. It's a construction of huios, H-U-I-O-S, which means a son or kinship. Now, to the Jew to say son, you have to remember this. It did not just mean somebody in the family. It meant anyone who was willing to do the will of the father of that family. And if you were coming into Israel and you were coming from some foreign nation or you were a Gentile, you would be considered a son if you would do the will of Abraham and that was to be circumcised and live according to the laws of God and that stranger that was brought into a household was adopted and he had just as much right and just as much inheritance as the literal son. In fact, there was something among the Jews. They said, if you were adopted, if you were adopted, you could not be disinherited, but you could if you were a literal son. Mm. So, evidently, they had to check out the adopted sons, because the adopted sons had to really be righteous for a man who would adopt him and bring him into a righteous family. In fact, you can remember some of the, you remember Eliezer? And Abraham said, he is like a son to me, God. There's no one more righteous than Eliezer, this son of mine. And God said, no, that won't be your heir. It'll be one that comes out of your own bowels. In Eliezer, we will see him in heaven, and he will have as much right to be an heir with the Father as anyone else. He was so righteous, he never complained. You remember, he, Abraham even said, Eliezer, you go to the land of my fathers, and don't take a wife for my son Isaac here. Eliezer did everything he was told. And he was an heir of Abraham. Now, look here. I want us to see this. This comes from Huios and the word. This, this is a construction of Huios and Thesea. Thesea is actually the word T-I-T-H-E-M-I. -E that means to level in a passive or horizontal posture. Notice horizon there. It means to level in a horizontal posture. It means to bow to the will of a father. So adoption meant to bring a son into a family that would level to the will of God. That word tithemai comes from the word E-U-T 
T-H-U-S, that's the word straight, the baptism is a well, T-I-T-H-E-M-I, a well leveling, and that's what causes us in a baptism, a blood baptism, meant to undergo a death in an order for a child, in order for a son to mature and become complete. Don't your kids have to die to themselves, Debbie? Don't your kids have to die to themselves? Don't they, Larry? They, they have to die to your will. That's what this daily cross is about. It's about dying to our own will in order that we may be completed. All this is about, it's a family thing. It's about growing up in the family of God and getting the whipping every day. It's what it's about. That's all it's about. And he'll teach us to grow up and be like Jesus, our big brother, who did the will of the Father and he didn't complain when, he, when Pilate and all those that gathered together that day to kill him, he didn't say, well, this is not fair. I haven't done anything wrong. That's what you do when you're a kid, don't you? And then, now, when you quit being a kid is when you quit saying, this ain't fair, I ain't done nothing wrong. When you grow up and you come to a place and say, this is the will of God in my life, and I'll take what is, appears to be unfair. You think it's unfair? Is that what you really think? You don't think you need somebody throwing stones at you as David had throwing at him? You remember that? He had, the guy was throwing stones at him, and, and uh, what's his name? Abishai. Abishai. Uh, the nephew of David said, let me go over there and take this dead dog's head off his shoulder. David said, let him throw stones. I've committed adultery and murder. I deserve what he's throwing at me. If God wants him dead, he'll stop him. Anything that seems unfair in our lives is fair for what we've been, isn't it? Andy's got the best praise for it. What's that? Well, I'm gonna. If you don't speak up, you better hurry up. We're not gonna wait. It's going, it's, to. it's going the way it's supposed to go, isn't it? Everything's going the way it's supposed to go. That's exactly right. Okay. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, we're gonna level to the will of God and be completed and grow up by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. Let's look at a couple other places of this thing on adoption. Go over here to Romans 8. Go to Romans 8. We're going to come back to Ephesians 1. Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. And look here at verse. Here's the same word. Romans 8. And let's start here in verse 8. In verse 14. Well, let's back up a little. Verse, let's go back to verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if this, and Christ is in us, and you remember Paul spoke in the previous chapter about there's an inner man and that there's an outer man and the inner man serves the law of God and the outer man serves the law of the flesh. And he said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We have an inner man and we have an outer man. Now, look here. And he says, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, 27. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. This is not talking about the change. This is talking about making us alive in Christ. And when he makes us alive, that's the word quicken is the word Z-O-O-P-O-I-E-O. -O -O -E -O. It comes from Z-O-O-N. That means to that means alive. And of course we go to the zoo to see living animals and P O I E O that means to make means to make alive. 
All right, where was I? 11. But if the spirit of him, and what is the spirit of God? It's the truth. It's the Holy Spirit. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's your ability to be able to discern what the truth is. In fact, you know what God does when he makes you alive? He gives you the ability. The spirit is truth. John, John uh, 14, 16, 17, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, 1 John 5, and 6. The spirit is the truth. Now, the truth is this, A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A, aletheia, that's the word truth, and it comes from the word L-A-N-T-H-A-N-O, that means, that means to lie hid, and when you can tell the truth, when you place the alpha primitive in front of that, that's the A, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, that negates the word lanthano, or whatever word you put it in front of when it's a negative particle, and it gives you an opposite meaning. It means not to leave anything hidden. When you have the truth, it's the ability to stand in front of someone and pull the cover off and tell them the truth and say predestination is true. It doesn't matter whether this whole Baptist church believes it or not, whether this whole church of Christ believes it or not. It's the truth. It's the ability to say it, rip the cover off at any time cost. That's what having the truth is. Or that's what having the Spirit of God is. It's Christ in you. Then he says, but if Christ, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies and you will come alive and be obedient as a son of God. That's what you'll do. By his spirit that dwelleth in you. If you have the spirit of God, God's going to have to whip you and spank you and beat you to make you obey him. And only when you mature will you be willing to die. And you know what? You'll do it. Jesus said, they hated me without a cause. It wasn't my fault. But I died anyway. And you'll take it as a lamb brought to slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. The time will come in your life, even when you're being done unfair, you'll say they had no reason to do this and they hated me without a cause. Look at that. Just hold your place there and look over there at John 15. Look at this. Look at this. John 15. Right here. You say, but it wasn't my fault. Jesus is simply relating to us that it wasn't his fault. He had done nothing wrong. He was innocent, but he became a martyr. And do you, I said this a few weeks ago, do you think that God is not able to fight your battles for you? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Isaiah said, Isaiah 53. That means to bear the arm, to pick up a sword and fight for someone. God will fight your cause when you, when you have done no wrong but God won't fight your cause when you're ready for him to fight. He'll fight when he's ready to fight, and he'll only fight for you when you bow to his will and take the blame. Because anything that's done to us, we deserve it. We're all sinners. Look here at verse 25. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause, for no reason. It wasn't my fault, Jesus said. I did nothing wrong. But he didn't complain before the enemy. He didn't say that before Pilate. And you're only mature when you come to a place where you can take the blame. When it wasn't your fault. And you all know that doesn't truth always out in the end. You don't have to sit there and try to figure out how to absolve yourself. We've got someone to fight our battles for us. Now let's go back over here to Romans 8. Therefore, brethren, verse 12, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit, through the truth, do mortify, necro, N-E-K-R-O-O, necro, necromancy, N-E-K-R-O-O, 
N-E-K-R-O, M-A-N-C-Y, that's talking to the dead. And Nekaro, mortify, means to kill off. Now, if we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, if you die, you'll live spiritually, and that is the only way. In other words, if you're adopted as a son, and you're carried all the way through to the end, and if you grow up someday, and you learn to take the blame, even when it isn't your fault, I'll tell you something that you'll have to do. You're going to have to do that when you marry, aren't you? Huh? Have you ever taken the blame when it wasn't your fault? Huh? Sure you do. Everybody has to do that, has to take the blame, don't they? Yes. Have you ever done that, Jim? Yes. You have to do that. Well, I ain't never going to. I ain't done nothing wrong. That means you're still a baby. I'm not taking no blame. I ain't done nothing. Well, if Jesus had said that, you would have had anybody die for you, would you? That's called mature, is what it's called. Now, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, by the truth, they are the sons of these are the sons of God, the ones who level to the will of God, mature, died to self. For ye have received, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage. That word bondage is the word dulia, D-O-U-L-E-I-A. D-O-U-L-E-I-A. It comes from the word D-O-U-L-O-S, that's the word slave or servant. It means we're not slaves of this world. What is it the flesh does to us? It makes us lust, doesn't it? I want my way. I want what I want. I want the clothes I want. I want the car I want. I want the house I want. I want the ring I want. I want my own time to do my own things. I want. That's all the flesh does, doesn't it? And you will cease to live. Let me read that again. For as many as are led by the truth, these are the sons of God. And if you're never led by the truth, you're not a son. To the Jew, you had to be leveled to be a son. He was a seer. Sons leveled. Leveled regardless of who's going to give you the blame. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear phobos. We don't fear men in the world. But ye have received the truth of adoption, the spirit of adoption. What adopts us is the Holy Spirit. Truth comes to live in our heart. How does that get there? It's birthed there. It's written there by God. It was once written, was once written, once written on tables of stone. That's that word, euthesia. That's that word, adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness. You remember that word? Let me write this down. Let me write this down. The Spirit itself beareth witness. I, I got to do some erasing here. Sumartereo mai. You remember that? Huh? It takes two witnesses to put a man to death in Israel. You remember that? And if you are going to be a son of God, you're going to have to die, and you're going to have to agree with the inner man. That's what you're going to have to do. And the inner man says, die. You say, it's not my fault. Yes, it is. Sin is something you have to bear the burden for. And a lot of times, you know, if we would stop and think, if we would stop and think Jesus took the blame for us, and sometimes when we're getting blamed, I like, I'm not a great fan of Chuck Colson, but Chuck Colson said something that I like. And he said, I didn't do 
the things that I went to prison for, for what I was accused in the Watergate. But he said, I did some things that were a lot worse than that. And he said, that was a light sentence for what I deserved to get in prison. Now, next time you get blamed. Yeah. Now, next time you get blamed, he was Nixon's hatchet man in the White House. <laughs> the next time you get blamed, think about what you did do to deserve the blame you're getting. <laughs> huh? Uh, <laughs> now, I know that's going to be hard, but we all think when it comes time, I don't deserve this. I'm not to blame. Yes, you are. We all are. That's something that children say. It's my fault. Yeah, it's not my fault. <laughs> now, he says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. Beareth witness is the word. <laughs> S-U-M. That's in fellowship with, isn't it? M-A-R-T-U-R-E-O-M-A-I. That means to be martyred, M-A-R-T-Y-R, to die in fellowship with. The Spirit itself, it takes two to cause a man to die in Israel, and I won't go into that, but the Holy Spirit, the inner man, says, Vote with me! We say no! And he whacks us with a paddle. He calls the scourge and says, I said, vote with me. And he whacks us and beats us down and finally gets us raised down on the floor. And he says, you're guilty. We, just, we fight it all the way. We're contrary, just like a rebellious child, a rebellious teenager. We say, I'm not taking the blame. It's not my fault. God says it is. I've got a personal testimony on that. I sang in gospel music for years. I had a singing group, and it was just a really super singing group. And everybody knew we were really good. And when we'd go out on stage for the once every once in a blue moon, we'd get to go on one of the big concert stages. The Oak Ridge boys would come and watch us from the eaves. They'd be going, wondering, how do those guys sing all that pretty stuff? And we'd walk off cocky and arrogant like, we may not be as famous as you, but you had to watch us. And God had to beat me and whip me, and I couldn't break into the big gospel arena because the word had gotten out. Jim Brown had a big mouth, and, and he'll get up on stage and say stuff about gospel singers being womanizers, and, and I'll do it now, and I ain't got nothing to lose, so I'll take that. Uh, and they were. And I used to blame the big gospel promoters. I used to blame the big gospel singers back in the 60s. I used to blame James Blackwood and J.D. Sumner and the Goodmans. I used to blame them because they wouldn't let me in. And they actually sent my brother to me and told him to tell me to get out. They wouldn't let me in. And I, I kept trying to break that circuit for years and years. But you can't do that when you're not like those people because they only cater to their friends. And they kept whipping me and beating me down and cutting me out. So I just took my group and went off into the music business. And I ended up going down on Music Row and butting heads with those guys because I was an independent person and I wouldn't be anybody's pawn. And I kept on doing this till I finally just nearly died of pneumonia, laying in a bed for months and months. And then I ended up in a hospital. I got up, well, I got up out of bed after six months in bed nearly dying, and I ended up in a hospital in Hendersonville after about seven years of real estate being a high rolling real estate agent, and then I got to blaming the big realtors and the big moguls and the brokers, and I kept blaming everybody. And you know what? They really were doing me wrong, and some of them were really stealing from me. But I ended up on my deathbed in Hendersonville Hospital looking at an old Shackleton Road I knew Shackle Island Road, and I looked out there, and I sat up on the side of the bed, and it's the first time I ever said this. I dropped my head, and I said, Lord, you're going to kill me with these people, aren't you? It's my fault. I'm sorry. I just, I, it's the first time I ever said, Lord, these are just swords in your hand, and you're whacking me with them. 
Now, I could name you every instance anything happened that I wasn't at fault and I had not done anything wrong. But I was trying. You know what I had done wrong? I was proud. I wanted to be a famous singer and get a lot of applause and love Jesus at the same time. I wanted to shine up there on the same level with Jesus and I didn't know that was my fault. And the first time I ever said it's my fault was I was about 45 years old sitting on the side of a hospital bed in Hendersonville Hospital. Now, you see, I could name all the reasons it wasn't my fault why those people. But what God was doing, David said, deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword. And God was picking up some of these men and hacking at me. And I'm screaming at the sword. Yes, it's your fault. Yes, it is. Trying to be proud and lifted up and as arrogant as I have been tried, proud, proud and lifted up and trying to shout above others, God resisted the proud. God resist. Who do you think James was talking to when he said that? Vessels of wrath? No. No, sir, he wasn't talking to vessels of wrath, fit of destruction. He's talking to believers when he said resist. It's A N T I. T-A-S-S-O-M-A-I, that means to wage war against. Now, this is what he's going to do to you. And the word proud is H-U-P-E-R-E-P-H-A-N-O-S. It's a construction of hooper, meaning above, and phanos, P-H-A-I-N-O-S. That is the word to shine those who shine above others and want to shine above others that are believers, God will pick up your enemies. It might be your wife, your son, your daughter, your husband, and he'll beat you with them. And you'll say, that's not fair. I wasn't doing anything wrong when he did this. That don't matter. You are wrong. If I'm wrong, don't think if God's beat me into submission, and I'm not completely in submission, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm willing to say I'm wrong now. It's, it's a lot easier once God gets you to saying, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. You know why people don't want to say that? Makes them feel like little kids again, doesn't it? Like they're losing. Like they're losing. You think God can't fight your battles for you? You're, we're, you know, you have you noticed us grown-ups ain't a whole lot different than our kids and our teenage children and our little, little bitty ones? Huh? Yeah. Good morning. This is God. I'll be handling all your problems today. I will not need your help. Have a nice day. Thank you, Jim. That's true. God doesn't need your help. But you say, but I, it's not my fault. Yes, it is. Who do you think's beating you? If you're getting a beating, who do you think's doing it? Just your enemy? No. They are God's sword in God's hand. And what he's doing is completing you. He wants you to come to a place and say, yes, it's my fault. I deserve the blame. Whether, whatever I did in this situation, I deserve the blame. We're all to blame, aren't we? Huh? Saying it's not my fault. God whipped me so hard, he nearly, he put me on my deathbed about a dozen times. And if God will just take you there, you'll wake up one day, and you'll bypass all those people that you used to blame, and you'll say, that's you, God, picking these people up and whacking me with them. And God's beating you for your pride above everything else, above anything. That's what he's whipping us for. And that's how he completes his sons. That's how he levels his children. That's the inner man telling the outer man, you're going to die. Do you understand that? You're going to level to my will. <clears throat> the inner man is Christ. The outer man is self. That word sumartoreoma means to witness in fellowship with and will fellowship with Christ. And he will whip us and whip us and whip us. And if you don't bow one day, you may be 75 years old. And if you're a believer, you'll say, it's all my fault. You mean even the part that wasn't your fault, you'll say it was my fault. That's what he wants from us is to realize what sinners we are and how immature children we all are. And he wants us to die 
When we die, you know what we're doing? Taking the blame, aren't we? Didn't Jesus take the blame? For a while. And was he to be blamed? Wasn't he blameless? Wasn't he without fault? Do we deserve the blame? Everybody in here deserves the blame. <coughs> For everything that goes on in your life. You know, only God could do what he did. Yes. Yes. Let me give you this. Let me show you this. I, I, I brought this out one time. That word, joint heirs, is the... Uh, let me give this to you. I just thought I'd give this for those that wasn't here when I did this. I did a, a whole study on gematria. Gematria is the, the assigning of the... Greek and the Hebrew alphabet, when the, when the alphabets were created, when they were created, <coughs> they assigned each one of the letters a numerical value. And to show you how God has just got this whole thing arranged in such a magnificent manner, I'm going to show you this word fellowship. The word fellowship in gematria is the word Soon, let me give it to you. Soon, S U N K L E R O N O M O I. <coughs> Soon, Claro Nomoi. Nomoi is plural, O I is plural. Let me give you these values. This at the sigma is 200, the upsilon is 400, the nu is 3, 3, the cap is 20, the lambda is 30, the eta is 8, the rho is 100, these were signed long before this scripture was written. <coughs> the rho is 100. The omicron is 70. The nu, the nu is 50. The omicron is 70. The mu, the m is 40. The omicron or the o is 70. And the iota is 10. This adds up to, this is the construction. This adds up to 1,071. That is 7 times 153. And this goes with what we're talking about. 7 is the number of baptism. <coughs> and turn over to the book of John, 21st chapter. That's the number of baptism and the number God's going to have to beat you to make you be obedient to him. Seven. Go to John. Twenty-one. Yeah, it's going to be a fish story. If I can find John. John 21. Peter said, down here, verse three, I go fishing. <clears throat> and he went out to fish. And verse 7, Therefore that disciple whom the Lord loved, that's the way John always spoke of himself in the third person, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were, 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes, as soon then as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals, and fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land, full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty-three of them. And no man can come to me, Except my Father which has sent me, draw, H-E-L-K-O, and that's the word used here, to drag in a dragnet of fishes. 
Hmm. 153, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Seven is the number of baptism, and God's going to have to scourge in order to cause us to witness with him. Sumartoreomai. In 153 is nine times 17, and nine comes from the word Teshua in the Hebrew, and 17 is the number of T-O-W-B, Tovei, that's the Old Testament word for A-G-A, T-H-O-S. When God takes seven times baptism and puts you through the baptism, he'll call repentance to come in your life, and it'll be good. That's good, isn't it? Let me just give you one other, two other words here. And the fishes that they drew in, let me give you this. Did y'all get that? Huh? What's that bottom one? I, an iota or eota. Let me show you this. In Luke 9 and 13, when the young man had five loaves and two fishes, the word fish, I'm going to show you why it's fish. The word fish is iota, kazi, theta, Upsilon, Epsilon, Sigma. Okay. This is uh, this just shows you what a magnificent God we have. What, what word did you say that was? Fishes. Luke, Luke 9.13. He had five loaves and two fishes. The word fishes, out is ten, because Z is six hundred. Theta is 9, Upsilon is 400, Epsilon is 5, and Sigma is 200, and that is 1,224 is what it adds up to. That's 8 times 153. What's 8? The word 8, the word 8 and here come from the same word Shema in the Old Testament. 8 times 153. God will cause us to hear as his fishes and in the womb, in the womb, in the woman's womb. What's the five loaves signify? Well, I hadn't gotten to that, Mary. Five is the number of grace. Wait a minute, I do have that too, excuse me. <coughs> I got that on the paper here. Hold on a second. In the womb of the woman, the baby is in a blood sack for 40 times 7. 7 is the number of baptism. 4 is the number. 40 or 4 is always the number of... 4 is the number of how many judgments God has. Sword, famine, pestilence, beast. Do you remember that? And the baby in the womb <coughs> stayed in there, 47s. In the baby in the womb, the Jews called the baby the fish because it was in a, it was not only in a blood lake, it was inside the amniotic sac. That was a lake just, just as the, just as the ark was in a, was in a, uh, in a sea. And the Jews called the babe in the womb, the fish, or the air. They called it the fish. Yeah, they called the ark a, a giant egg, and they also called it a fish when they deified Noah as Dagon. Now, the word loaves... In the sixth chapter of John, when the young man had the five loaves and two fishes, let me give you this. Here's the word loaves. I just thought this would be something good to put down here. I did a whole series on this, and I don't have time to go into all of it. I didn't really, I wasn't bit prepared to do this. <coughs> okay, now, 40 weeks, 47s. Now, here's the word loaves. 
It's the word A R T O U. Wait a minute. I changed from English to Greek to English. Well, wait, that was right. A R T O U S. Their A, that's their A. It's artus, that's the word lows. The alpha is one. The rho is 100. The tau is 300. The omicron is 70. The epsilon is 400. <coughs> the sigma is 200. That is 1071. Or 7 times 153. That's the lows. And 1 Corinthians 10, 17 says, We being many are one bread. We're the bread, we're the heirs, we're the fish. I just thought I'd stop and give you that. thought y'all might like that. Huh? What? What'd you say? <coughs> That's right. Now, let's go back to the adoption. You see, we're talking about being heirs of Christ. Let's, let's look at the next verse on this. I thought I'd just stop and give you that. I thought y'all might. For those who wasn't here, I've got, we got about 10 or 12 tapes on the gematria, and I go through all this, and we put all this out on the board, and it, it kind of hurt all of our brains, didn't it, Jim? <laughs> We'd leave here and feel like our brains were fried. Now, look here. The Spirit itself beareth witness. That's the verse 16, Romans 8. Beareth witness with our spirit. Witness means to die. Sum, martyreo. We have to be in fellowship with Christ. And he insists that we die to self. And we give up and we take all the blame. And it doesn't matter whether we're, we think we're at fault. We deserve what we get, don't we? we? And if we get anything better than hell or a good billy club or a a rod upon our back or a scourge, if we get anything other than that, it's grace. Isn't it? That's called unmerited favor. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. The inner man tells the outer man to die and he bears witness and he causes us to be willing to take the blame and die and to be completed and grow up and be martyrs, witnesses, or mature. Now, you're not mature until you're willing to die. Don't throw that word around mature like it's just, hey, I'm mature. You're not if you're not dying. You're not taking the blame. If children, then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That's the word joint heirs. Sum, sum clero pneumoi. It comes from sum meaning in fellowship with, in kleros means to fill up the nomos of God. And nomos is the law of God that we have to follow, isn't it? That's the word law in the, in the New Testament Greek. And he says, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, look at the next word. Look at the next word. Verse 23. And not only he speaks of the creation groans and travails and pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. The first fruits was the bread crop that came into Israel, have the bread of truth. And Jesus speaks of his truth being bread in the 6th chapter of John. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our bodies when we're changed and we get a new body. Let me read to you what Mr. Uh, Mr. Dyson says in his book. I've been reading from one of Dyson's books, but this is Paul a study in social and religious history. Let me read to you what he says about heirs, okay? When you're talking about adoption, the place that they would go and buy slaves that they adopted in the family, they did that at the agarazzo. That's the marketplace, A-G-A-R-A, 
I believe it's, oops, hold on. A-G-O-R, A-G, hold on a minute, I got it, A-G-O-R-A-Z-O, agorazo, that's the, A-G-O-R-A-Z-O. They would go and redeem, they would redeem in the marketplace. That's where they would redeem the people. Usually somewhere in the market at the gate of the city. And he said, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our bodies. We have, now, there's something that has, there has been a down payment, just like earnest money on a house. Go back over there. Go back over to Ephesians, the first chapter. Ephesians, the first chapter. The down payment is the spirit, the truth. Christ coming and washing us. One day he'll make full redemption. Before I do that, let me read this, what he says here in, in his book. This is Diceman. I really like Diceman. He's just so good about what these things mean. Listen to this. He says here, speaking of being sons and being adopted, uh, he speaks of the contrast between present possession and future full possession, which we found in the Apostles' Assurance of justification can also be observed in his idea of redemption. Those who are already redeemed still wait for the redemption of the body. The day of redemption still lies before them. He hasn't totally redeemed us, but he is going to do that. He's going to complete this whole thing. Instead of slaves, we become free men in Christ. How little Paul binds himself dogmatically with, these, with this metaphor is shown by the fact that he occasionally employs the figure of a slave in making another contrast. Instead of slaves, we become in Christ sons of God. The contrast is carried out by Paul through the use of the ancient legal concept of adoption. And I like what he says in here. He said, there's only one son of God that's not adopted. It's not literal Israel. It's Jesus. Numerous inscriptions and also papyri have enabled us not only to illustrate the word Paul uses here, but have also taught us how frequent adoption was in the Hellenistic world of those days and how readily understood by the people the apostles' metaphor must have been. This is especially true of a thought which is entitled to a place in this circle of metaphors and which Paul found in the Septuagint and in the words of Jesus that God has drawn up a testament. What's a testament? What's a will and testament? That's a legal document that's drawn up before somebody dies and when Christ died, the person has to die without the death of the testator there's no testament. He had to die before he left us an inheritance, didn't he? And made us heirs. In our favor that we therefore are to expect an inheritance. How clear and comforting these words and others like them. Thou art no longer a slave but a son. And if a son then an heir through God. How they have sounded in the heart of a man of antiquity. Who without explanation understood that the adopted son was also the heir. But this whole series of ideas is not made dogmatically rigid. The adoption through God, which we have experienced in Christ, still remains the object of our expectation of our inheritance. We possess, through the Holy Spirit at present, only earnest money. That's the verse in Ephesians 1 and 14. Which is, let's read 13 and 14. Speaking of Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. A promise has been made, just as earnest money is made on a real estate contract, which is the earnest. That's the word. Arhaban, A-R-R-H-A-B-O-N. I believe it's Arhaban. 
I believe that's it. I've got it written down. A R R H A B O N. A R R H A B O N. Now here's what this means. Is that correct? Somebody. Huh? Oh no H. Okay. A R R A R A R H A A R R A B O N. Okay. Yeah. A B O N. Now here's what the word is. It means property given in advance as security for the rest that is to come. And it means pledge or purchase money. It's the same thing you put when you put money down on a house as earnest money with a contract. What if I said with a covenant? He says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, our new bodies there in the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. Unto the praise of his glory. Let me read this. Let me finish reading this. That all these concepts of justification, reconciliation, forgiveness, redemption, adoption are not distinguishable from one another like the acts of drama. Adoption stands side by side with redemption. Without the redemption, when they would go into the marketplace, they would redeem a slave and they would free him. Let me give you this, if I, if I can find my paper on it. That's our inheritance. Let me give you this word inheritance. Back up to verse 11. Back up to verse 11. We have obtained, in whom also, speaking of Christ, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Let me give you the word inheritance. This will really open, open some things up for you. Okay. Inheritance. Here it is. Right, right here. All right. Here's the word inheritance. K-L-E-R-O-N-O-M-I-A. You remember soon Clara Nomia was the word fellow heirs. And it comes from Clero, K-L-E-R-O. Now, claro means a portion or to finish something. It actually means a portion. Now, what would you think of when you think of a portion? Maros. That's what I think of, maros. Maros means something to eat of, to eat of. And when you don't have the portion to eat of, when you place the alpha primitive in front of maros, it negates maros. That's the same word that Jesus used when he was given a piece. The Bible used when Jesus was given a piece of fish. It's the same word. Maros is the same word when we're members in particular of the body of Christ and we eat of the body or we partake of the body. Same words. We place some alpha in front of maros. It translates A-R-M-A-R-T-I-A -A with the alpha primitive in front of it. That's a H sound, harmatia, is the word sin. It means to miss the mark or to miss the portion of the boundary line. And of course, the word, the word nomia, that we get from that, that's the word nomos, that, that's the word law in the Greek, and that's the legal food. We have a legal food as inheritors of the kingdom, and that is God's law. We are his sons in his family. We are who Othosia. We're level to the will of God. That's what we are. And we're level to his law and to his will. Is there one word for that? Huh? Well, it's the word claronomia. Well, it's inheritance right there in verse 11. In whom we also have obtained an inheritance. 
See, predestination is about being sons and being obedient to his word. He's predestined us to conform and eat as inheritors of the kingdom as that's what we're supposed to do. Let me read some more of this out of, out of this right here. <clears throat> he says, adoption stands side by side with redemption. Now, the word redemption, the common word for redemption is one of Glenn's favorite words. you remember that, Glenn? Huh? It's the word apolutrosis. A-P-O. L-U-T-R-O. S-I-S. It comes from apo and lutrosis, and we get from that we get the word L-U-O, which means uh, to wash fully. And what are we washed with? With the word. That's the truth. Thy word is truth. Where am I? The word is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. So we're washed by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's not jumping up and down, getting excited, turning cartwheels. The Holy Spirit's the truth. So that's the earnest. The earnest of the inheritance is God's word, the truth. We've got, let me read some more of this here. We've got so many more of these things to go to. I, I can't get to it all. Hold on a minute here. Let me see if I can find my, yeah. Hold on here if y'all won't go away. Okay. No, nope, can't find it. Oh, here it is. Redemption. I just wanted to put this up here. Let me write this down where y'all can see this. Let me. Apolutrosis is the word redemption. And we're redeemed by what? By the blood of Christ. And what is a blood baptism? A death. And what's that? The daily cross. And that's, that's what redeems us, and that's what clothes us, and baptism is a clothing. Let me write this down. Here's what we're, here's what sons are. When they'd go into the marketplace, they would buy a dolos, a slave. They would free them and bring them into their household if they, if they saw fit. That's what Christ has done, is freed us from Captivity, hasn't he? And what's the word that means to free? Aphesis, A-P-H-E-S-I-S, A-P-H-E-S-I-S. -S, that's the word forgiveness. That's the word remission. And that's the same word in Luke 4.18 as deliverance. These people that have deliverance ministries, they're ignorant. Deliverance is the word offensis, and that means to pardon and release from prison or from bonds or from captivity. From captivity. We're redeemed. That's redemption. That's redemption, and that's what we're adopted. That's what adopts us. It's forgiveness. We're forgiven and released from bonds. Let me write these words down. Apolotrosis comes from apo, comes from apo, meaning to loosen. Oh, not to loosen. That means apo means total. Excuse me. Means a total or complete. Means a total or complete. And the word lutron, the word lutron, which means to loosen, with a redemption price and, the, and it means atonement. Atonement is the baptism because baptize means to come from the word bapto means to cover with a stain or die. Cover with a stain or die and that's what baptism is. It's a blood baptism. A blood baptism is a death. That's atonement. Atonement, as eight souls were saved through water, the light figure went to even baptism, but also now save us. And the ark was pitched. And the first word pitch is the word kafar. That's the Old Testament word for atonement. We're saved the way they were saved. 
We're redeemed. That's the word redeemed, apolutrosis. And it comes from lutrao, L-U-T-R-O-O. That means to ransom or redeem. And that comes from the word A-P-O-L-O-U-O because this word atonement, which comes from the word lutron, which comes from apolutrosis, means to atone for or to wash with the blood of Christ. And this word apolutrosis, Apoluo means to wash fully. We're washed with the blood of Christ. That's how we're adopted as sons. Aren't we? This thing, now when we're talking about, let me ask you this. When people say, I came into God's kingdom by my own free will. When you are an orphan, do you adopt yourself into a family? Pick a family out and say, I'm going to adopt myself. Who does the adopting? The one who's being adopted? If you can do that, go find you a big, rich billionaire and adopt into that family. That's what they did. They got the one that distributes fortune. Anyway, that's what they did. They got the devil. They, they did. They got him a billionaire. His name is Satan. And they're adopting into his family. See, it's the one who decides to adopt by his grace. He just, when somebody goes to an orphanage, what do they do? They go out there and they pick out one. And they say, I'm going to pick out one. And what do you call that? Grace. That is probably one of the best pictures of grace. And some people who would go to the orphanage, they would look for the most downtrodden, the most dejected, the most backward and say, that one's the one that needs my help. If a person had grace, they would go and say, that's the one that needs me. This kid over here who's leading everybody and he's the popular kid on the block, he doesn't need me. That one needs. That one has a need. Right? So if you were a gracious person, that's what you'd do. You'd go to an orphanage, orphanage and you'd find the ugliest one, the one with the least personality and say, that one has a need and that's what God has done and he's not going to leave us orphans that's what he said I'll not leave you comfortless what's that word orphanos O-R-P-H-A-N-O-S orphanos I will not leave you orphans we're the one that has a need and I could go right into anoint there because the word need my God shall supply all your need comes from the word anoint. And anoint means to smear all over with a stain or a dye. And we're smeared with the blood of Christ, aren't we? Look, at, look, look here. I've got a couple more of these. I've got, a, I've got all these verses on redemption of the body. Look at Romans. He has not fully redeemed all of us. He's got to give us a new body. Go over here to Romans. Go to Romans 8... Well, I, I went to that. No, I already read 8.20. Did I read 8.23? Did I read Romans 8.23? Let's read that again, though. Because I want you to see that. Here it is right here. Romans 8.23. Then let's go over to, sec, uh, to 2 Corinthians 5. 8.23 and go to 2 Corinthians 5. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, are the bread of truth, Bread. First fruits was the bread crop in Israel. First fruits that came into Israel was the barley harvest and then the wheat harvest 50 days later at Pentecost. Even we ourselves groan, stenazo, that word groan comes from the word stenos, which is the word straight. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Stenos. I believe that's the word S-T-E-N-A-Z-O. Isn't that? Do you have your... Do you have your... Uh, your inner linear there, Ken? That word groan, I believe it's the word stenazo. Or it's a derivative of the word stenos, and that's the word straight. Enter ye in at the straight gate, and that means to go through a narrow opening, and that's a synonym for the word thalibo, which is narrow. Narrow is the way, and he says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the total redemption of these bodies where we get new bodies and we'll be blameless. 
And nobody can put any blame. Let's go over here. That's when he comes back. And go over here to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. That's what this is talking about. This is the total completing and perfecting of God's people. It's what it is. This is a family. This is the adoption and the inheritance that God has given to us. Look over here. Look over here in 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Now here's the total redemption and the total adoption. The adoption, God's not completely, totally finished the adoption until he gets us out of these bodies. And these bodies don't want to take blame. These bodies are to be blamed. And what he's going to cause us to do is to die to these bodies and die to this flesh and die to self. And when he raises our enemies up against us, most of the time as believers, they are hurting us. They're doing us wrong for no reason, no cause. They have no justifiable cause to do what they do to us. And the reason they do it is over the truth, isn't it? You say, well, I'm not, I'm not false. I ain't going to take the blame for that. Well, you better learn to. Now, what did I say? Oh, here we are. Look at verse 1. 2 Corinthians 5. Here's what we're waiting for. This Now, he's going to complete us and make us grow up. Here's what he's going to do, people. He's going to make us mature. If you'll get old enough and live long enough, He'll make you come to a place where you don't mind taking the blame for anybody around. I've said this before. When y'all want to fuss at each other and blame each other, if y'all will call me and tell me it's my fault, I'm at a place where I can take the blame now. I'll take the blame. But if I take the blame for you, I get to repent for you, okay? And that way, <laughs> I get to repent for you. I'll take the blame. Jim, I don't like it because my wife did this or my husband or my kids did this. Well, call me and blame me. I say, okay. Because it, you know, you know how much most of these fights we have in our families and among each other are worth nothing. Because <laughs> we deserve all the blame we're getting, don't we? Huh? We're to be blamed. Everybody Every one of us. Blamed. Huh? If everybody took blame, there wouldn't be no fight. Me and Mary used to fight like crazy, and I know nobody believes it, but we did. But you know when, you know when we quit doing that? Well, and that wasn't when we got to be 25 or 30. That was, it was late 40s. That's the whole thing. Is it's when we started living our lives talking about Jesus all the time, talking about truth. Now, I know nobody has this problem here, do you? Uh, uh, why don't we think that God can, can take care of our problems? Why do we not believe that? We don't believe it, do we? Look here, let's read this. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, word just means to disintegrate or, or to demolish, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. That's not talking about our mansion. That's talking about <coughs> new bodies. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about finishing the adoption. For in this we groan. The word groan is stenazo there. It means to be in straits and to sigh as we're going through all these problems. Stenazo. In this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our house, which is from heaven. When you give up trying to defend these bodies because God says die, you're to be blamed, that's when we start wanting new bodies. Only in the last 10 years have I really started desiring to go be with the Lord. Now, I'm 59 now. Since I was 49, I've been desiring. That's when we started this ministry. I was 49. And I really don't mind taking the blame. I just want to lay down and say, Lord, I'll be glad when this is over. And we want our new house from heaven. If so be that being clothed 
we shall not be found naked. And what are we clothed with? The blood of Christ. And what's that? That Our garments have made, been made white in the blood of Christ. And we talked about the clothing being the blood baptism. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. This is a struggle. And what are we struggling with? Our enemies know self. We're struggling with taking the blame for what we deserve. And the older you get, isn't it easier to take the blame now, Al, than it used to be when you were young? I bet you never did take blame. When you about 25, you were probably mean as a snake, yeah. wasn't you? A little later than that. Huh? <laughs> well, I bet you, I thought, I said this a few weeks ago that Al was a pilot, uh, one of these flying, one of these jets in Korea, and he was the biggest smart aleck, because jet pilots are smart aleks. <laughs> they think they're bigger than everybody, don't they? And you had to be just the most arrogant guy to be around back then. Uh, but isn't it easier to take the blame as you get older and fat? Uh, <laughs> and you get overweight, you don't care. I mean, there was a time he wouldn't be found. It, it's old. It's, it's easier, isn't it? It's just, Jim, isn't it easier as you get older to take the blame? It's so easy. Isn't it, Lorraine? It's that gum. I, I, you're not going to be blamed when you're young, are you? You're not going to take the blame. I'm not taking the blame. I didn't do anything wrong. Everybody's thought we're through. I guess they start walking and standing up. <laughs> we don't care. Let's read the rest of this. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed. To, we don't just want to die. We want to be clothed. We want to be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. There's that same word. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, by death to self, and not by what we think we see. We need to die to self and not walk by what we think. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And when you start maturing, that's what you want. You want to be clothed with the body. And that's the full redemption and the full adoption. It takes the whole thing to adopt us totally. We're just in the process of adoption right now. We're being bought. And the, pri the down payment's been made. That's the, what was that? You're bought with a price, and that was the blood of Christ. And that's the baptism. That's the closing. And what is that? Death to self. Take the blame. Because how many of you here don't deserve the blame? Hmm. When somebody gives you thunder and you have some problems, do you, de do you really deserve it from some actions you've taken before? Well, you think maybe God, that's why God's doing it, because you hadn't learned to repent of the actions you've taken before? So God raises up enemies, and sometimes they're family. Sometimes it's somebody living in the house with you to beat you up. We're going to stop right here. And uh, I, I'm going to come back and talk some more about adoption because adoption means to be leveled as a son. And God don't just bring us into the family and level us one day. He whips us and takes his paddle right here and just beats the tire out of us. I love, to see, I love to see a mother and father bring a paddle to church. I like to see that because the Bible says if you don't beat your son with a rod, you hate him. Or your daughter, and that if you, that it's not going to kill him. And the Lord says He beats His children, but if you beat somebody in public with this, they're going to say, "Child abuse, take your kids away from you." Boy, we're in a stupid world, aren't we? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, help us to understand that our full adoption is that we would bow to your will, and that's what we're predestinated to adoption. God, that we walk within the boundary and the borders of your word. God, we thank you for truth and, and that we're fellow heirs and joint heirs with Christ and that you're going to cause us to go through this seven times baptism so we can repent and that's good. 
Thank you for that, Father. And we give you the praise for all. Teach us to take the blame because every one of us deserves it. In Christ's name, amen.